Hello, Facebook family, and welcome to today's version of Noon with Nash. Again, I just want to thank you for joining us today, and it's my hope and prayer that as we dive into God's Word together, that the Lord will speak. Turn with me, if you will, to the 26th chapter of Matthew, and we're going to continue our conversation that we started yesterday. Have you ever denied something that was, well, undeniable? I ran across these memes on Facebook that really kind of proved my point better than I could possibly describe it. Have your children ever done something like this? Chocolate? What chocolate? Or then there's this one, and I tell you, I love Charlie, my dog, but sometimes he gets into things he shouldn't be getting into, right? Donuts? What donuts? The reality is when we deny the undeniable, it simply makes us look silly. Now, I'm sure when I was a kid, I did a better job of denying things, but kids these days, I tell you, you can see right through them, can't you? Well, this passage that we're going to be studying today takes place at the exact same time as yesterday's passage took place. While Jesus was undergoing his trial in front of the Sanhedrin, in front of some of the most influential and important people in all of Jewish society, Peter was undergoing a trial of his own. However, his trial was a little different. His trial wasn't in front of important, influential people. His trial was in front of his peers, just people. And as successful as Jesus was in his trial, Peter was equally as much a failure at his. Well, let's look together in the 26th chapter of Matthew. Starting in verse 69, we have this recorded. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant approached him, and she said, You were with Jesus the Galilean too. But he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again he denied it with an oath, I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there approached him and said to Peter, You certainly are one of them, since even your accent gives you away. Then he started to curse and swear with an oath, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you will be with us as we open up your word. Speak to our hearts, Lord. For your servants are listening. And I pray, Father, you will hide this man behind your cross and speak through these lips of clay. Not my words, Lord, but yours. It's in your holy, wonderful, and amazing name we pray, Lord. Amen. Now, all four Gospels relate Peter's act of denial. He probably used it himself in his own teaching and his own preaching. He probably used it to illustrate how completely Jesus forgives. And isn't that a glorious truth? Peter's denial was predicted. In Matthew 26, 31 through 35, Jesus and, and all the disciples had this discussion. And Jesus told the disciples during the Passover meal, said, Tonight all of you will run away from me. And all of the disciples denied it, but Peter denied it even more. Peter told him, Even if everyone runs away because of you, I will never never run away. And Jesus calls him on it. I assure you, Jesus said to him, tonight, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter's response, no, Lord, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. Yet another example of Peter making a bold statement. Now, I'll be honest with you. In this instance, and really in many other instances, Peter probably gets a bad rap to an extent. I mean, Peter was afraid. It was common practice in that day that if a teacher was accused of being a false teacher, many times his disciples would be pulled in with him and suffer the same fate. 
So I'm sure Peter was scared. And honestly, it probably took some guts to even go as far as he did and follow Jesus to see what happened. But he didn't exactly have high hopes of how things would turn out. I mean, Matthew 26, 58 ends with this description of Peter's attendance. It says he was sitting with the temple police to see the outcome, to see how it turned out. He, he wanted to know, but he did not want to be involved. He might have been telling himself, I will not abandon Jesus. I will be with him. But he's not exactly doing anything for him, is he? I want to compare Peter's trial to Jesus' trial here. I mean, again, Jesus holds up astonishingly well under truly life-threatening conditions. And Peter, in front of a lesser audience, with less on the line, fails miserably. First, we have Peter's first denial. It happens in verse 69. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant approached him, and she said, You were with Jesus the Galilean too, but he denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you are talking about. You know, Peter is right where we left him there in verse 58. He is standing there with the, the, the police and with the officials and saying, just watching what was going on. Okay? And then... Who makes this accusation? First of all, we know two things about this person. One, it's a servant. So again, on the social ladder, a servant is pretty low. But then we also learn it is a girl. And I'm not saying this was right, but I'm just saying this was true. A female servant was about as low as it gets on the social ladder of biblical times. Women just were not societally as important as men. So here we have Peter in a far different audience with far less on the line, and he denies it. As a matter of fact, Peter uses the exact same Greek word when he denies knowing Jesus as Jesus used when talking to Peter that you will deny me. The exact same word. To avoid the awkwardness of this conversation, Peter just kind of gradually makes his way towards the edge of the crowd. Then we have Peter's second denial. In verse 71, it says, When he had gone out to the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were there, This man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again, he denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. This time, Peter denies even knowing Jesus. He uses an oath, probably to God, to indicate that he is absolutely telling the truth. And if we compare this to Jesus revealing his true identity following the high priest's oath, and Peter denies Jesus' identity with an oath of his own. Peter's sin and guilt are increasing both in severity and in number. Then we have Peter's third denial. Verse 73, After a little while, those standing there approached and said to Peter, You certainly are one of them, since even your accent gives you away. Then he started to curse and to swear with an oath, I do not know the man. Immediately, the rooster crowed. This time, he is asked if he knows Jesus simply because of his accent. and He could have said, look, this is a holy festival. There are people all over the place that aren't from around here and sound like it. But that's not what he did. He replied with a curse and an oath, his strongest denial yet. He probably said something like, God will punish me if I'm not telling the truth. And because of God's grace, he did not punish Peter right then because he was not telling the truth. But what happens immediately? A rooster crows. You know, I think that word immediately is important. God doesn't want Peter to forget what he had said. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Luke adds the detail that when the rooster crows, 
Peter and Jesus make eye contact. That eye contact must have been so bitter. I'm sure in the garden, as he was fleeing from the garden, he was thinking, will I ever see him again? Will ever he ever see me again? And now they make eye contact and all it serves to do is to point out Peter's guilt and how he has fallen short. Imagine how Peter felt at that moment. I mean, Peter is known for his bold statements and his bold actions. I have I have frequently said, if any of the disciples ever say anything brilliant, it's probably Peter. But the other side of the coin is equally as true. If any one of the disciples ever say anything that's absolutely dumb, it's probably Peter. Because Peter, I mean, he really ascribed, go big or go home, right? And he was going big in everything he did. But I think something important begins here. Other than meeting Jesus for the first time, this is probably the most important thing ever to happen in Peter's life, is this cycle of denial followed by forgiveness. Because for the first time, I think Peter really truly sees himself through Jesus' eyes. See, this was a multi-step process. Right here is the first step. Here, Peter sees himself for the sinner that he really is. I mean, honestly, we all tend to see ourselves in the best light, right? I mean, that's just human. But here, Peter sees that while sometimes he's bold, and that's a good thing, right, to be bold, sometimes he's just cocky. Sometimes he's speaking when he shouldn't. Maybe for the first time, Peter truly sees himself as a sinner in need, not just in need, but in desperate need of a Savior. Did Peter like what he saw? Absolutely not. He went away weeping. How? Weeping bitterly. Absolutely miserable with the man who he's, he has discovered that he is. He is truly in anguish with the knowledge and the depth of his lostness. How did he respond? Well, eventually he made his way back to fishing. You know, John chapter 21 records an appearance of Christ after the resurrection, the first time Peter and Christ are face to face after the resurrection. And at that point, Peter's out fishing and and he comes to shore because he knows it's Jesus there sitting on the side of the shore. And Jesus forgives Peter three times to parallel his three denials. And I tell you, after this forgiveness, after Peter has fallen so short and then been forgiven so deeply and completely, he is a changed man. He is transformed. He is still bold. But now, instead of being bold for his own personal gain, he is bold for the glory of God. He is transformed from the fisherman who often sticks his foot in his mouth to the evangelist who speaks at Pentecost, and thousands come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. From the outside looking in, he probably looks a lot like the same guy. But from the inside, he is completely transformed by the forgiveness of Jesus. He is a new creation. That is what I pray for for absolutely every single one of us. Not that we would deny Christ. No. But we really need to see who we are as sinners in desperate need of a Savior. But the good news for us is that Christ has already been to the cross and Christ has already risen from the dead. We don't have to wait days between seeing who we are as a lost person to knowing what it can be like to be forgiven. Uh, again, I say it many times, there are only two types of people in the world, dirty, rotten sinners and dirty, rotten sinners saved by the grace of God. And the only difference, the only difference between those two sets of people is a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. A restored relationship with God through the blood shed by Christ on the cross. The reality is, we too 
can be saved. Romans 3.23 teaches all of us that everyone has sinned. I have sinned. You have sinned. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 teaches us that salvation is a free gift. All we have to do is accept it. It's free to us, but it wasn't free because Jesus paid a very high price on that cross for our freedom. Romans 5, 8 reminds us that Jesus went to the cross to die for our sins. He didn't go to the cross for him. He went to the cross for you and for me, for all of us. And Romans 10, 9 and 10 give us really the best news that there is when we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe God raised him from the dead, we can be saved. We will be saved. So will you please ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior today? This is the most important decision any of us can make. And this, this decision will make the largest impact on our lives that is possible. It's my prayer that all of us will seek Christ as our Lord and Savior. If there's anything that we can do to help you, if we can pray with you about anything, if you have made a decision for Jesus Christ today, I would love to hear about it. Please email us at prayer at ebenezercolumbia.com. Or if there's anything we can do for you, call us at the church office. I will put the church's phone number in the comment section after this video. Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? If not, what is stopping you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord, and we again just thank you so much for the many gifts and blessings you give us on a daily basis. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to show the world how important you are to us. Help us to live a life that glorifies you. Help us, Lord, to be salt and light in this world. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the cross. And thank you for the sacrifice you have made for us. We pray this in the holy and wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Y'all have a wonderful day. Serve Jesus.